that begins promptly at 6.30. So we need to be just as prompt with our agenda so that we can get through everything by 5.45. Thank you for your help with that. Uh, Item two on the agenda is the agenda itself. Does anyone on the board have any recommended modifications to the agenda? Seeing none, is there any objection to approving the agenda as proposed? Seeing no objections, the agenda as proposed stands approved. Item two B are the meeting minutes from the board's last meeting, which was held on February 1st, 2017. Are there any recommended changes to the minutes? Seeing none, is there any objection to approving the minutes as proposed? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved by consent, and thank you, Dot, for doing such a continuing great job as our stenographer. We really appreciate that. Uh, item three is public comment. Um, this is an opportunity for anyone from the public who would like to comment on any issue that is not on today's agenda to do so. Uh, we rely upon a sign-up sheet, which I have here. There is no one on it. Uh, is there anyone who uh, intended to speak but did not sign up? Now would be your opportunity. Please raise your hand. Seeing no hands, I'm going to move on to the next agenda item, which is item four, board consideration of the Hillborn Hillborn et al. 2017 paper. First, I will note uh, that in addition to the Hillborn paper, the board has also received a May 1, 2017 response to that paper from the Lenfest Forage Fish Task Force, and both documents are included in your meeting materials. Second, I will note that we have just 15 minutes set aside for this agenda item, so we are not anticipating an in-depth discussion of the documents at this point in time. Rather, our intent today is to bring these two recently released documents uh, with particular emphasis on the Hillborn paper uh, before the board and look to the board for guidance on how you'd like to proceed regarding their review and the potential incorporation of that review in the Amendment 3 process. Given the relevancy of the papers to the draft amendment and given that they have not yet been subject to technical review by the board's technical committee or the BURP working group, uh, one suggestion would be for the board to initiate a technical review via a tasking motion undertaken today and then circle back to the issue at our next meeting with that technical review in hand. Uh, I know that Megan, uh, our FMP coordinator, and Jason McNamee, to her right, have been discussing this matter, so I would like to now look to either or both of them to offer their thoughts on how the board might want to proceed on this issue. issue. Uh, Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll be very brief. Um, when we received the Lenfest uh, Forage Fish Report, that was sent to the BURP for a technical review, and then the BURP came back with their um, review of that paper. Um, so one option for the board is to pursue a similar avenue for the Hillborn paper, um, have the BURP read that over, provide their response, um, and review of it at the August board meeting. So with that, board uh, thoughts on this issue. Dr. Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would actually like to go ahead and request that the BERP, the BERP work group be tasked with the review of the Hillborn et al. paper, you know, in the same lens with which they reviewed the Lenfest ta uh, Forge Fish task, for task Force report for us um, a couple year, a few years ago. So I, I just don't think like it's going to be very productive for us to engage in much of a discussion today before we get that technical review. And if that has to be in the form of a motion, I'm willing to do that. Uh, I don't think we need a motion unless there's any objection. So I'll be looking for either concurrence on that or other thoughts uh, on, on the matter. Robert, you had your hand up and then I went down. Uh, just to concur, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pierce? Yeah, I, I do confer, um, and I'd like to uh, highlight uh, a couple of things relative to the paper that uh, I suspect might come up um, whenever a technical review was done uh, by the BURP. Uh, for example, uh, when does fishing forage species affect their predators? Uh, the authors of this paper, all seven of them, with Ray Hilborn being the first author, I assume, you know, highlight that they're looking at rate of change. Okay, so that's significant when we're talking about rate of change, predator versus prey. And that needs to be looked at. Um, in addition, it would be useful for there to be some reconciliation of 
what Ray Hilborn says in his recent text. Uh, he's the sole author with his wife, I believe, Overfishing, What Everyone Needs to Know. I've got great respect for Ray Hilborn. Uh, I read just about everything that uh, he puts out. And he has a chapter in his uh, book, they have a chapter uh, in their book that's basically questions and answers. And one of the questions is, do forage fish need special protection? And basically the answer is yes. So I read this and I hear what he says not too long ago, and now I see this paper with these other co-authors, and I'm left wondering, has he changed his point of view? Has he been influenced by the other authors? What do the data really suggest to him? And again, he talks about rate of change. So again, I'd like to see this review. Uh, it'll be very useful. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I don't have a problem with putting this in front of the technical committee. I think they need to take a close look at it. But uh, to a lot of us who spend time on the water, some of the conclusions that the paper came up with uh, seem unbelievable, I, particularly the idea that predators only feed on, on younger prey and it uses the example of Minhaden. And anybody who has spent any time in that fishery understands that aggregations of Minhaden drive time and area specific bites. I mean, they really do, striped bass really do focus on adult Minhaden. And, and that's really just one example. So I, I would have the technical committee really take a close look at those data sets because something is amiss. And, uh, you know, the whole idea that, that predator abundance is not related to prey abundance, just from an on the water perspective, de defies common sense. So I, I'd like to see a more in depth analysis of that. And I hope you guys uh, keep the common sense factor in mind when you do review it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Duvall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to clarify, um, with regard to Mr. McMurray's comments, it, the request was to have the BURP work group review it rather than the TC. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else on the board wish to comment on this issue? Yes, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I concur that um, the paper um, should be reviewed um, and that we should have that report back to us. But I would also request that during that review, um, special attention be um, given to the last part of the paper where the authors lay out what they um, conclude uh, to be key factors that need to be included when analyzing the impacts of fishing on forage fish. And they lay out five or six um, uh, key items that need to be addressed and included. So, so in, in terms of our review, I would, I would like some comment about how those key factors relate to where we're going with Manhattan. Thank you. Thank you. Good input. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Alice, Allison, I think you're new to the board. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, heard in your opening statements that there are also public comments submitted in response to the Hillborn paper. Uh, and I'm just wondering if the action that we're discussing also includes sending that response. Um, I think the authors in that public comment indicated that there would be a peer reviewed response coming out um, following the public comment. So I was just wondering if we are also considering sending the response to the paper to the BURP and or TC as well. Yes, I believe you're referring to the LENFEST uh, task force that did respond that is in b in your meeting materials today so we wanted to make sure it was before the board and that will be part of the uh, review undertaken it's essentially they provided their response now we're looking to our own burp working group to provide their response both will be essentially before the board in august for your review and consideration uh, next i have rob o'reilly thank you mr chair and i guess my question is um, not to uh, you know, belabor the review, but in the paper there are several references be, besides Pilkich et al. in 2012. Curry is mentioned fairly frequently, um, Smith et al. I'm just wondering when this review takes place, and I don't know the answer here, will you also look at some of these other papers? Is that part of the process? Well, I think the Motion, well not the motion, the recommendation before the board is to just review the Hillborn paper. Um, and if you wish to expand on that, you're welcome to. But I think right now that's the, uh, that's the issue. Go ahead, Rob, follow. Uh, 
I think it just may be important to look at some of these other papers as well, the underpinnings for some of the premises that are here. Um, you know, I don't want to make it exhaustive, but maybe just to be able to look through them would be important. Get a sense of it. Yeah, it's a, that could be a pretty big lift, Rob. I mean, we, I, I very much respect your recommendation here, but... Um, I don't mind if you, they don't do it. I just was bringing it up. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. I'll stop. All right. Thank you. For, thank you. Um, I did, let's see. Was there one more? Uh, Emerson, and then I'd like to try to wrap this up. Thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a second comment. Um, in, in terms of review of the Lenfest, res Lenfest response, if, if they're going to uh, go forward with a peer-reviewed publication relative to their response, I think it would be more appropriate to wait until that, that publication actually comes out because what comes out of a peer-reviewed publication may be a little bit different than what they sent us as public comment. Thank you. Thanks. That's an excellent point. And, and to clarify, and I may have misspoken in, in response to Allison's question, the LENFEST response stands on its own. It's, it's not going to be subject to further review. What's going to be subject to review is the Hillborn paper, and LENFEST has already responded to that. As you say, Emerson, they may well pursue that further via peer-reviewed um, paper, and if so, we'll bring that back before the board as well. We, we definitely don't want to get into the business of trying to referee all these different scientific perspectives, but given the relevancy of the, this Hillborn paper in particular, um, and of course the LENFEST response, we just simply want to make sure they're part of the mix. And I think uh, with the benefit of a technical review by our BURP working group, delivered for our August meeting, we should have, a, I think, a, a decent handle on this issue and be able to hopefully engage in a more thorough discussion on it. So if there's uh, no other hands up and I don't see any, I'm inclined to move on to the next uh, agenda item with the understanding and, and concurrence of the board that this will be uh, uh, moved to the BURP Working Group for a technical review and report back for our August meeting. Thank you for a good discussion on that. With that, we'll move on to item five, which is the BURP Working Group progress report. Um, this is just a quick five-minute update on the status of uh, the working group's efforts to develop ecosystem-based reference points for Menhaden. And I will turn to Shanna Matson, who I, our commission's uh, fisheries science coordinator for this uh, review. Shanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we're going to dive right in here to what should be a very familiar slide, because I show this to you guys every time I give you an update. Um, just looking at where we're at in 2017, um, so essentially the BURP work group has a pretty full next few years coming up to make sure that we are delivering our promise of ERPs by the 2019 um, time frame. So in 2017, we've already completed um, one of these workshops, which I'll get into briefly um, on our next slide. Um, and we have two other in-person meetings scheduled, one to review another one of our modeling approaches. Um, and we have various calls scheduled throughout the rest of the year. We have a call coming up actually in a few weeks. Um, and we'll, again, be scheduling then a call to review the Hillborn paper as the board has just requested. Um, coming up in 2018, we will start our process of having our um, data um, workshops. So essentially, we anticipate probably having two data workshops due to the number of modeling approaches that we are considering and the fact that uh, these are multi-species models. So there's going to be a lot of data coming in. We're not just going to be vetting data for one species. We'll be vetting data for all of our predator species and all of the other prey species that will be input into these models. Um, and then in 2019, we will move into our assessment workshops. So again, we probably anticipate having about two assessment workshops, um, and that will have to take place prior to uh, the 2019 peer review, where we anticipate all of our models going together as a package, along with the single species BAM model uh, for review in 2019. So we'll have those results for you hopefully in 2020. Um, again, I just want to remind the board that this is kind of the first time that we're attempting to do this level of modeling to generate these ecosystem reference
reference points. Um, it's a very ambitious timeline. We are cautiously confident in our ability to get these to you in 2019. Um, we haven't experienced any hiccups yet. We are on track, um, but I will continue to keep the board apprised of the situation um, as we move through the next few years. So um, our April modeling workshop that we just had a few weeks ago um, was focused on our multi-species statistical catch at age. Um, you guys have all heard statistical catch at age modeling before. Uh, this is the multi-species form of that. Um, this uh, catch at age model is actually being developed by our very own Jason McNamee. Um, the committee provided Jason with some suggestions for some modifications, um, some comments that they had. Um, and from those recommendations, the group will be uh, putting together a subcommittee of people who work closely with our old MSVPA model um, to kind of look at some of the diet data inputs that we want to put into that multi-species uh, statistical catch age model. Uh, we were also updated on some of the outside uh, modeling approaches that are in development, um, as well as uh, heard some updates from a few of the other models that we considered in uh, 2016. Um, we also just held a call on April 24th, so just a short time ago, with the uh, LenFest Forage Fish Task Force. Um, the reason that we held this call is we wanted to ensure that the reference points that are being, um, you know, that are being uh, looked at in Amendment 3 are actually calculated and are, you know, congruent with all of the recommendations that um, LenFest has um, in their paper. Um, we developed a list of questions that we distributed to the task force prior to that call just so they understood um, the modeling questions that we would be looking at moving forward. Um, and uh, we wanted to have a discussion later uh, based off of their responses. So for our near future plans, as I mentioned, we're going to have a call um, that'll be on May 19th. Um, and the group is going to review the uh, recommendations that the task force provided us on the previous call. Um, and again, look at some of the calculations that a few of our committee members have already been working on just to make sure that the whole committee um, is on board with the way that we've decided to move forward with these calculations. Um, we do anticipate that these calculated reference points will be available for Megan to place into draft amendment three for further review by the AP, I believe. Um, later in June, and um, these will be ready for um, August meeting week for the board to look at as well. Um, as a heads up, as I said earlier, the BURP is also going to meet twice more in person this year. Uh, we're looking at a late summer in-person meeting to review a uh, surplus production model uh, that's in development outside of the work group. Um, and at the end of the year, the group is going to meet again in person, and that will sort of be our final decision workshop, I'm calling it, where we'll go through, we'll look at all of the modeling approaches that we've been considering over the past few years and decide which of those will move forward into the peer review phase. Um, and as always, we will continue to keep you guys updated um, during our May and October meeting weeks. So I, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Shanna. Questions for Shanna. Emerson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Shanna, for your presentation. Um, I think it was your second or third slide that you had up there with relative to a, a recent conf um, conference call you had on last week. Or so. Yeah, I think it was that one. Right. So uh, I'm just a little confused um, relative to the second bullet there. Ensure control rules in Amendment 3 are congruent with the intention of the Lundfish report, uh, Pickett et al. in 2012. Didn't either the technical committee or the, or the uh, working group determine that that, that that paper was not relevant to what we we're trying to do with Menhaden management, Menhaden ecosystem management? Um, yes, Emerson. So from one of our earlier memos that we distributed to the board um, after our review of the LenFest report, the BURP did find some issues um, with the paper. Um, they did say that they believed that uh, this would not be applicable to Menhaden management. However, the board did want to leave those reference points in Amendment 3 for consideration by the board as well as the public. 
Um, so that would be up to the board to see how to move forward. So um, the BURP is still working to make sure that um, the calculations that are done with those reference points are correctly done. Emerson, oh. do you have a follow? Yes, thank you. So are, are those the only reference points that are, that are going to be brought back to the board, or are there other reference points that are being developed as well? I'm going to let Megan take that. Hi, Emerson. Yeah, there, there are other options, and I'll be going through draft amendment three just after Shanna's finished, and I'll be talking about the options that are in the document. Other questions for Shanna on her update regarding the BURP working group? Seeing no hands, thank you, Shanna, again, for a great update. And we'll move on to item six on the agenda, which is, um, as Megan just uh, indicated, an update on the development of draft amendment three. Um, I'll just give a couple words of intro here before turning things over to Megan. As everyone is aware, the board moved to initiate the development of the draft amendment at our last meeting in February, and the target date for bringing the document before the board for final review and approval as a draft before going out to public comment will be our next, will be at our next meeting in August. As such, today's meeting constitutes an interim stage in the process of developing the document. This midstream status affords the board an excellent opportunity to review the progress made to date, consider some recommendations offered by the board's allocation work group, and consider any other recommendations that anyone on the board may wish to offer. That's exactly what we plan to do over the next hour or so. As we engage, keep in mind that the draft amendment remains a work in progress and no final decisions will be made on the issues and alternatives that will go out to public comment until our August meeting. That said, the document is certainly taking shape thanks to the excellent work being undertaken by Megan and the plan development team. So as we engage in our discussion today and move into the final three-month phase of our draft plan development, I strongly encourage everyone on the board to continue reviewing the issues and options set forth in the document with a view to ensuring that they are presented and bounded in a way that gives the public a clear understanding of our current management program and the alternatives being considered. That clarity will really help to focus public comment, which no doubt will be significant given the issues at hand. So with that, I am going to be turning things over to Megan for an update. Uh, her up update will wrap with a series of questions and work group recommendations, which will serve as the basis for our initial review and discussion today. After we work through those issues, I will open the floor to any other comments or recommendations from the board regarding the draft amendment. And if time allows, and I hope it does, I'd also like to provide an opportunity for public comment. Uh, my goal today with all of these issues is to seek consensus and call for motions and votes only if there are competing views among board members. So with that, Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will be doing an update on Draft Amendment 3 today. Um, I do just want to kind of underline the disclaimer that this is a working document, uh, so I fully expect changes to continue to be made up until the August board meeting. Um, and there's really two purposes of this re review. The first is to provide an opportunity for the board to kind of see progress thus far and make any suggestions or modifications. And then it's an, also an opportunity for the PDT to ask questions of the board. Um, and as Bob alluded to, there are a series of questions that the PDT has for the board so we can get a bit more clarity moving forward. So this is our timeline for Amendment 3. Uh, we are in the preparation of Draft Amendment 3 step, and we do expect that to take us to the August board meeting. Hopefully at that point the board will approve the document for public comment, which would make our public comment period likely from late August to potentially early October. And then the board is scheduled to take final action in November. So just to kind of orient everyone to how Amendment 3 is organized, there are seven different chapters. Uh, chapter 1 is our introduction, so this states the problem that we're trying to address and also provides a description of the resource, fishery, and habitat. The second chapter is our goals and objectives, so this outlines the purpose and need for action as well as the reference points. 
Chapter three is our monitoring program. So this looks at things such as harvester reporting as, why, as well as biological data collection. Chapter four is the management program. So this is gonna look at things such as allocation, episodic events, incidental catch, as well as any provisions that are under adaptive management. Chapter five is compliance. Chapter six is research needs. And then chapter seven is protected species. Today I'm gonna to be focusing on chapters two, three, and four. However, if there are any uh, comments or questions on the other chapters, I'm happy to answer those. So starting off with reference points, those are in section 2.6.4. There are currently five different reference point options in the amendment. Option A is our single species reference points. And then options B, C, and D are all looking towards the Menhaden specific BURP ERPs, um, but those interim, uh, interim ERPs are what differ. So in option B, it's the interim use of our current single species reference points. In option C, it's the interim use of the 75% rule of thumb. In option D, it's interim use of the Pikich et al. reference points. And then option E is kind of our combo option, which is the fishing mortality target consistent with achieving 75% unfished biomass and our 40% threshold. Um, as Shada just talked about, for options C, D, and E, the BURP gr working group is still working on the calculations for those reference points, um, but we do fully intend to have those ahead of the August board meeting and included in a subsequent draft of the amendment. Section 3.1 is commercial reporting, and I did want to highlight this section because there are some differences that may occur depending on the allocation method that is chosen. So we would still have reduction reporting through the captain's daily fisherman reports. And if a jurisdictional quota is implemented, then states could maintain at a minimum their current uh, monitoring system. However, if jurisdictional quotas are not implemented, we need some way to monitor landings in season so that we could follow um, things such as a fleet quota or a regional quota or a sector quota. And as, current, uh, as Amendment 3 currently reads, states would work to uh, report through SAFIS. So there are a couple reasons why the PDT is re recommending SAFIS. Um, first, it allows us to monitor landings in near real time, and this will be particularly important if there are regional, fleet, sector, or seasonal quotas. And then it also is an established coastwide program which fulfills state and federal reporting requirements. Uh, if there are any concerns about SAFIS, now would definitely be the time to bring that up before the board. And if there are other suggestions on how to monitor seasons, uh, quotas in season, uh, the PDT is all yours. Section 4.3.1 is the TAC. So we are using the same tax setting method as Amendment 2, where the board can set an annual or multi-year TAC, and that can be done through the projection analysis or the ad hoc approach. However, one of the new portions of this amendment is what we're calling the indecision clause, um, and this is resulting from our healthy debate on the 2017 TAC. Um, and so there are a couple reasons why we're putting this in. Um, we need to specify what happens if the board is unable to come a, to a decision on the TAC for a given year. So that's why we're putting this clause in. Um, as it current, currently reads, if the board is unable to approve a TAC for the subsequent fishing year by December 31st, the TAC is set at one half of the TAC from the previous year. Um, I do want to note that this is definitely not a carrot approach. This is more of a stick approach um, to getting the board to a consensus. Uh, the board or the PDT did discuss keeping it at status quo. So if there is not a decision made, um, keeping the tack from the previous year and moving it into the next year. However, there were a couple concerns that that might actually provide incentive to avoid a majority vote. So for example, if the TAC is low and projections suggest that it could be increased, there may be some incentive to not have a majority vote to keep it low. 
On the other end of the spectrum, if the TAC is high and projections suggest that there needs to be a decrease, there may be incentive to keep that TAC high to not have to take that cut. So that's how we ended up at one half of the TAC. I, the PDT is all ears if you have another suggestion for what is a more appropriate level. All right, moving on to section 4.3.2, which is quota allocation. So just to orient everyone to how this is set up, there are three different tiers in this section. And this is to try and accommodate the different combinations of uh, allocation methods and time frames that can be used. So in tier one, we have our disposition quota, which is the bait versus reduction quota. We also have fleet capacity quotas, seasonal quotas, allocation based on TAC level quotas, or none of the above. In tier two, we have our coastwide quota, our jurisdictional quotas, a fixed minimum quota, and then regional quotas. And then in tier three, we have our time frames. So just to provide an example of how this would work, for the board to kind of choose the current management approach, the board would choose none of the above in tier one. They would choose jurisdictional quota in tier two, and they would choose 2009 to 2011 in tier three. So you have to choose an option in each tier to kind of create a, uh, an allocation package. Diving into these tiers a bit more just to provide a, a bit of information on these different allocation methods. So the first one is our bait versus reduction. And there are two sub-options for how to split the quota between the two sectors. Um, Sub-option one is 70% goes to the reduction fishery and 30% goes to the bait fishery. And sub-option two is that the split is based on historic landings. Um, and preliminary allocation percentages for this option can be found in table one of the amendment. Next is our fleet capacity quota. So we have, two, again, two sub-options here, either a two-fleet or three-fleet approach. And then there are also sub-options which look at whether that small capacity fleet can be managed under a soft quota. And just to provide a bit more context on that soft quota approach, the small capacity fleet is still allocated a portion of the quota. However, their fishery would not close if that quota is met. And the intent of this is kind of to reflect the ebb and flow of bait landings, where in some years they might be a little bit above that quota, and some years they might be a little bit below, but in the end it all kind of evens out. Uh, we also have seasonal quotas here, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but kind of previewing a question I have for the board is if the board is still interested in this option. Um, one of the things to consider is states have not submitted monthly landings. Um, and my sense is from some states that might be hard to get going back to 1985. Um, so if the board would like to pursue this option, I probably will have to use ACCSP data uh, to calculate those percentages. And then we have allocation based on attack level. So under this option, we have a baseline TAC of 212,500 200, 212, metric tons. If the TAC is below this, then we keep our current allocation method. Is it, if it is above it, then that remaining, or that difference is allocated to the reduction and the state bait fisheries um, in different percentages. Uh, we have different sub-options there. All right, next on to tier two. Um, so the first option is our coastwide quota. Our second option are jurisdictional quotas, and percentages for those can be found in Table 7 of Amendment 3. Next, we have our fixed minimum quota. Um, so in this case, each state gets a fixed minimum amount of quota. We have sub-options for either 1% or half a percent. And again, those allocation percentages can be found in Tables 8 and 9. And then we have regional quotas. Um, so we have three sub-options there. We have a two-region split between the Chesapeake Bay and everyone else, a three-region split between New England, the Mid-Atlantic states, and the South Atlantic states, and then a four-region split between New England, the Mid-Atlantic states, the Chesapeake Bay states, and the South Atlantic. And then finally, tier three, these are our allocation timeframes. So just a reminder, they are 2009 to 2011, 2012 to 2016, 1985 to 2016, 1985 to 1995, 
and then a weighted allocation between 1985, 1995, and 2012 to 2016. One thing I do want to note is that Florida did not collect gear-specific data prior to 1993. So what this means is for some of the older time frames, we're going to have to use data from 1993 and 1994 to kind of back calculate what those gear landings are for something like a fleet uh, capacity allocation method. And then a question that's been brought up is, do historic reduction landings from states which no longer have a reduction facility count towards the allocation percentages? And this will be one of the questions that I'm hoping to get an answer from the board today. So this is what the allocation section looks like, and I'm hoping uh, people can actually read this, because the point is that there may be too many options in this document. Um, so what we have here is our different tiers, we have different options, we have the sub-options, and then we have the sub-sub-options. Um, and I think the concern of the PDT is that this number of options may hinder effective public comment, and it may also hinder resulting board action in November. So kind of one of the themes I'm hoping to get across today is how can we hone in on the number of management alternatives in this section. Section 4.3.3 is quota transfers. So quota transfers only apply if a regional or state-based quota is chosen. Uh, the PDT did not feel it was appropriate for uh, transfers between either the bait and reduction sector or different fleets. Um, there was a request at the February board meeting that some guidance be provided on what happens if a state receives multiple requests at the same time. And so Amendment 3 recommends that if a state or region receives multiple transfer requests, the transfers are considered in the order in which they were received. We have four management alternatives here. Option A is kind of our, our status quo, so quota transfers would continue as they do now. Option B is our status quo, but it tries to build in some accountability measures so that states aren't perpetually exceeding their quota and then using transfers to try and address that issue. Um, so this says if a uh, state or region exceeds its quota by more than 5% in two years, it cannot receive a quota transfer in the third year. Option C is quota reconciliation. So just a reminder of how this works. If the TAC is not exceeded, then any state or region overages are forgiven. However, if the TAC is exceeded, then any unused quota is pooled and that's distributed to states or regions that had an overage. Option D here, again, tries to build in some accountability measures. So under this option, the amount of overage that's either forgiven or the amount that's distributed to states is dependent on the number of previous years of overages. So the more overages a state has had in consecutive years, the less uh, amount of overage will be forgiven. Section 4.3.4 .4 is quota rollovers. Uh, the PDT has tried to tailor this so that quota rollovers uh, will work under each allocation method. However, it's important to note that quota rollovers are not permitted if quota reconciliation from the previous slide is implemented. Uh, there are five different options for quota rollovers. Option A is no quota rollovers. Option B is that 100% of unused quota can be rolled over. Option C is 10% of total quota can be rolled over. So for an example, if I'm a state and I have 1 million pounds, um, I could roll over 100,000 pounds of unused quota. Option D is obviously quite similar to that, except 5%. And then option E is rollover of 50% unused quota. So another example, if I have 500,000 pounds of unused quota, I could roll over 250,000 pounds. Section 4.3.5 is incidental catch. So the first thing that this section does is define a small-scale gear from a non-directed gear from a stationary multi-species gear. I think one of the challenges with Amendment 2 has been that it's kind of unclear who can participate in the bycatch fishery. And so the PDT has tried to define these different gear categories so that we can develop options that pertain to each of these categories. Um, they are not exclusive, so some gear types do occur in multiple categories. 
We now have six options for incidental catch. Um, to kind of separate them, options A, B, and C do not include bycatch in the tack. Options D, E, and F do include bycatch in the tack. So one of the pieces of feedback we had received from the board was to develop options that do include bycatch in that tack. Option A is a trip limit for non-directed gears. So this would be kind of your true bycatch definition where something like a pound net would be able to harvest Menhaden after the directed fishery has been closed through a trip limit. Option B is probably closest to status quo. It's a trip limit for non-directed gears and small scale gears. So here both pound nets and cast nets would be able to harvest Option C builds on this by adding a cap and trigger. So it sets a cap at 2% of the tack. Um, and if this cap is either exceeded by 10% in a given year, or if it's exceeded two years in a row, then that would trigger management action. So the board would be triggered to consider ways to reduce bycatch in the Menhaden fishery. Option D is an incidental fishery set aside. So 2% of the tack would be set aside for incidental catch, which occurs after the quota is met. Option E is a small scale fishery set aside. So this sets aside 1% of the tack for small scale gears. And these gears would harvest from this set aside throughout the year. And then option F is all catches included in the tack. So once the quota is met, the fishery would close. 4.3.6 is episodic events. So currently, um, as Amendment 3 is written, eligibility is for the states of Maine through New York. Uh, it's the same mandatory provisions as under Amendment 2. So harvest is restric restricted to state waters. There is a trip limit, daily trip level reporting. However, the PDT has tried to provide greater guidance on ways for states to prove a high abundance of Menhaden. So things such as surveys or landings reports, fish kills, uh, we've tried to provide a bit more guidance to states in the application process. There are three options here. 1% um, of the TAC is set aside for the episodic events program. Option B is an increase, so 3% of the TAC is set aside. And option C is 0% of the TAC is set aside, so that would eliminate the episodic events program. 4.3.7 is the Chesapeake Bay cap. So under option A, this is our status quo, where the cap is set at roughly 87,000 metric tons. And then we have sub options that allow for either a portion of rollover of that cap or no rollover. Option B would set the cap at 51,000 metric tons, which is roughly the five-year average. Um, and again, we have options that allow for a rollover of a portion of that if it's unused or no rollover. And then option C would remove the cap. So that is chapters two through four of Amendment 3. Um, kind of getting back to one of the the messages or themes of this presentation, how can we hone in on the number of allocation methods? Um, the allocation work group met to review Amendment 3 and also to provide some recommendations to the board on how we can try and uh, hone in on some of these options. So there were four questions that were asked of the allocation work group, and I'm going to provide their responses. So the first question is, are there any benefits or concerns for either the two fleet or three fleet allocation method? And the recommendation of the allocation work group is that the board maintain the two fleet quota option but remove the three fleet option. Um, the allocation work group felt that the two fleet option is less complex and still achieves the goals of the allocation method, which is to provide equitable access to the fishery for all gears and also reduce the administrative burden on states. The second question asked of the allocation work group is should soft quotas be included as a management alternative? The allocation work group recommends that soft quotas be maintained in a, as a management alternative for small capacity fleets, but that further, uh, the PDT further develops clear and upfront controls on this fleet. Um, the PDT has started to work on that, but this is something that we would continue to work on if the board agrees with this recommendation. 
The third question is, is there a regional allocation method which best reflects the Menhaden fishery? The allocation work group recommends that the current regional allocation options be removed from Amendment 3 and that it, they be replaced with an option that establishes a regional quota for the New England states but maintains jurisdictional quotas for the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic states. Um, some of the members of the work group expressed concern that regional quotas um, could result in states being shut out of the fishery due to the timing and the movement of Menhaden. However, they did note the episodic nature of the New England fishery and that may warrant a regional management approach. And finally, the fourth question asked of the group was, should historic reduction harvests from states which no longer have a reduction fishery be included in the landings used to calculate allocation percentages? And the recommendation of the work group is that landings data prior to 2017 is not used in this amendment. 2007, my apologies. <laughs> um, so they pointed to a couple of things. Um, they pointed to inconsistent reporting for several states prior to this date. Um, they noted that this time frame only includes one active reduction plant. And many pointed to some of the management challenges that are occurring with summer flounder. As a result, they are recommending that the uh, current allocation time frames be replaced with the following. 2009 to 2011, which is our status quo. 2013 to 2016, which is four years under Amendment 2. 2007 to 2012, which is the six years before Amendment 2. 2012 to 2016, which is the five most recent years of data. And 2007 to 2016, which is the most recent decade of data. Um, one of the last slides here, this is just kind of a FYI for the board. Um, New York did submit a proposal to recalibrate their Menhaden landings due to inconsistent or non-existent reporting. In the proposal, they compare landings from 2013, 2016 to 2009 to 2012 to scale their historic landings. The PDT is in the process of reviewing this proposal and they will provide a recommendation to the board in August. So just to kind of leave the board off with some questions from the PDT, again, how can we hone in the number of management alternatives in this document? Should the three fleet option be removed? Should soft quotas be included as an alternative? Is the board still interested in seasonal quotas? Should the regional allocation options be replaced with an option that creates a New England regional quota but maintains state quotas elsewhere? And what time frame should be used for allocation? Thank you. And thank you, Megan. Really excellent uh, presentation. Uh, so here's what I'd like to suggest. Instead of an open um, question period, as we typically do after a presentation like that, let's work through the issues that were teed up um, by Megan's presentation, at least initially, address any and all questions along the way. Once we get through those issues, we'll open the floor to any other suggestions, any other recommendations pertaining to anything in the document, but I just wanna kind of manage the discussion here by staying as focused as we can. So issue number one, just drawing from this slide that Megan has left up, is uh, the recommendation that the two fleet option be maintained in the draft amendment, but the three fleet option be removed. Are there any questions regarding this recommendation recommendation? Are there any thoughts regarding the working group's recommendation, um, which I just indicated? Uh, Dr. Pierce. Yeah, we're very well done presentation and the questions have been very succinctly uh, listed for us. So should the three fleet option be removed? Megan, I believe you in your presentation uh, noted the benefits of going with the two fleet instead of the three fleet. But what I, what I missed was um, the drawbacks. Did the, did the group highlight any of the potential drawbacks if we go to two fleet as opposed to three fleet? Uh, I'm leaning towards the two fleet, but um, again, what are the specific drawbacks, if any? I don't think any drawbacks were discussed on the call. Um, however, you know, just kind of outlining how the two fleet versus three fleet works. Two fleet is small versus large, so it's basically all gears separated from purse seines and pair trawls. 
In the three fleet option, there's smaller gear, so things like cast nets, bait nets, versus a medium fleet, which is something like pound nets, versus the purse stains. So I think it's uh, more about the division between those different gear types. So by going with the two fleet as opposed to the three fleet, we uh, put in the mix the pound nets and cast nets. So I, I guess that's the, I'm wrestling with that one. You know, what is a, what is a gear that's capable of taking a, a large amount of Menhaden, you know, in quotes, versus a, a much smaller amount that one would expect to get with a cast net. So, uh, I haven't yet been able to wrestle with that, answer that question. To what extent would we disadvantage the, the cast net fishermen as opposed to maybe not doing that? I'll leave that as a comment. Um, I think the good question and I think it was answered. Uh, any other questions, comments? Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, uh, on the same uh, thread, uh, Me Megan, can you explain to me uh, if the difference between the, the uh, two and the three uh, fleet, uh, where the cutoff would be. Um, and the particular issue we discussed at the last meeting was the difference in the size of the purse seiners. Um, and, and the fact that actually the, the fish traps, could, uh, at least in Maine, could have a fairly high catch. So, um, I mean, I'm not opposed to, to simplifying the document by going into a two fleet component. I just want to make sure that, you know, the, 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 the fishing effort is appropriately uh, divided. Yeah, so in the two fleet option, um, it's basically purse seiners and pair trawls versus everything else. So your main purse seiners would be included in that large fleet. For the three fleet option, the um, split for that large fleet is for purse seiners which have a capacity over the 120,000 pounds. So your main purse seiners would be in the medium fleet. To that point, thank you. In, in that case, I'm strong in support of the three feet, the three fleet approach. Okay, so we have a recommendation to um, just go with the two fleet uh, and not include the three as well. But we have at least one board member, Terry Stockwell, urging that it be kept in that three fleet option. So discussion on the issue, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Megan. Just a question. Uh, the fleet, whether two or three, is part of that whether some of the gear types in the fleet, the small based fleet, would be soft caps and some would be soft quotas and some would be hard quotas. Is that part of what is also being asked? Yes, um, so those two issues are very much related. So um, a sub-option of the fleet option is that that small capacity fleet be under a soft quota. So there's an option for it not to be under the soft quota and an option for it to be under the soft quota. So what you define as a small fleet will impact which gears might be subject to a soft quota. So I was hoping to reach consensus, um, and if we don't, uh, we can take a vote or we can just roll with what we've got. Uh, again, the idea here is to try and uh, give the PDT a, a, uh, as much guidance as possible as they continue their work on this document, which will come back before the board in August. So these issues could very well be um, you know, brought back in August for further discussion. But at this point, it's sort of an interim check. And this is, the, this is one issue. And uh, I'm looking for further guidance from the board on how you'd like to proceed on this. Uh, Emerson, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Megan, for your excellent presentation. You were able to synthesize uh, all those various options uh, quite well. Um, and looking in, in the document, um, under table two, which is uh, the, the two fleet option, there are, are different percentages there that are based on historical catch for, for different time periods. And then for the three fleet option, it's allocations yet to be calculated, right? So um, there's no direct comparison there uh, currently. And, and even if there were, are these, I know these percentages are based on reported landings, but uh, is, is that subject to change by the board in August if we wish to, or, some, or, or even further down the road in October, if we want to change what those percentages are? Thank you. So the percentages in table two are based on historic landings. So 
unless there's a change in, in historic landings, those percentages would not change, um, or unless the allocation time frames are changed, they presumably would not change. But there is not an option in here yet that says, um, you know, 5% goes to small fleet and 95 goes to large, and that not be based on an allocation time frame. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does, but what if we wanted to include a discussion about that? You know, about having the, the distribution between fleets, whether it be two fleets or three fleets, fleets be based on something other than historic landings over, over whatever time period we want to choose. Make it not based on historic landings. Yeah, if the board is interested in that, that is important information for the PDT to know. And let me just pick up on, uh, Emerson, your comment, because I think it's relevant to Terry's uh, perspective, and that is right now in the document under Table 2 is a breakout of what a two-capacity fleet allocation might look like depending on the time frame, and indeed there is a sort of uh, 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 hold under that for Table 3 uh, allocations not yet calculated. I think the challenge here is that it, well, it would be indeed a challenge to try to calculate allocations on a three-fleet basis because now you're parsing the per-sane fleet. You're taking historically those per-sanes able to harvest uh, up to, I forget what the cutoff is, um, it's in 125? 125,000 pounds, affording them an allocation in accordance with that middle fleet, uh, medium fleet uh, category, and then trying to go back and figure out how many persanes that were capable of harvesting more than 125,000 pounds, putting them in the large fleet. And I think if I'm not mistaken, and certainly anyone from the working group can, can speak up on this, that sense of trying to parse out the, the persane fleet into two different categories based on historical time fr frames was going to be a huge challenge. So why do it? Wouldn't it make more sense, and again, I'm trying to paraphrase the working group recommendation, to just have the per sane fleet in one category, per sane and paratrols, and all other gear types in the other? Terry, did you want to follow on that? Yeah, th oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, we, we entered into the development of this amendment with the understanding we we're going to completely uh, to look, at the, look at the reallocation from soup to nuts. Um, uh, by, by eliminating the medium capacity fleet, you're disenfranchising a complete gear type and region to start with. And uh, I just don't think it's right at this point. We, we, may, we, we may find further down the road that it, it makes sense to merge the two, but right now the, um, the large persane effort and, and, the, and the smaller person, they're, they're two different fisheries. It's, it's, it's different as between a, a, medium, a medium vessel uh, and, and, a, and a haul seine. They're two different fisheries and putting them in the same category, particularly as we go down soft quotas, time periods. I mean, I, I, I think we're, I know it's a bucket load of work, and I appreciate all the hard work that the TC and the working group is doing to develop this, but you, you, you lack the perspective of a, of a historic fishery in this working group to advocate for, for a, what last year in Maine was a significant fishery. So I, I, I hate to see us go through the efforts to develop an action right now uh, it, it, and, and at the very beginning, exclude exclude a, a, a fishery. So, that's, so I, I am strongly in favor of, at least at this point, uh, maintaining the three fleet option. Thank you. Fair enough. So what I'm going to pose to the board is that there is now on the floor a strong recommendation for keeping both the two fleet and three fleet options in the uh, document. I'd like to have uh, anyone speak to that in opposition. Is there anyone in opposition to keeping both in the document? Please raise your hand and speak to that. David? Uh, I'm not uh, in uh, opposition. I'm just trying to get my head around the issue, and I understand Terry's point here. What is, uh, if, if I can ask Megan a question, what portion, of 90, uh, almost 95 percent of the allocation goes to the large capacity fleet, is the way I understand it. Uh, so under the three fleet option, what portion of the allocation goes to the medium sized vessels? I don't know because I haven't calculated it yet. Okay, so uh, I mean, I, I, as I said, I, I recognize the point that Terry's making, and, and I understand the logic. 
But I also, looking at this, I think it's going to pretty much complicate uh, the document significantly if we have, and w one of the options would be to, uh, instead of having a 25,000 pound trip limit per day uh, on the small capacity fleet, to simply raise that to 125,000 pounds. So you'd have two fleets, one would be a large capacity fleet, the other would be a small capacity fleet, and the small capacity fleet would have a higher trip limit. Uh, that seems to, that should meet Terry's needs and uh, also simplify the document. Duly noted. Other thoughts or suggestions on this issue? Uh, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Megan, I think it might be helpful um, sometime after this meeting if you could um, uh, send out to the board members your, your, the summary slide that you had with the different actions under the various tiers. Because the, the question I have here relative to two fleets or three fleets is if we choose to just split the total allocation between the reduction fishery and the bait fishery, do we even get into a discussion about fleets? I, I can't recall from your, your summary. The answer is no. It, that would, these are, those are two different options under tier one, and you would only be able to pick one. The board would only be asked to pick one. Right, so if, if we chose the option of splitting the quota between the reduction fishery and the bait fishery, then we don't need to worry about two fleets or three fleets or four fleets or whatever. Correct. Thank you. If I see no other hands, so I'm going to suggest, based on the discussion that's taken place today, that both options, two fleet and three fleet, remain in the document for further development by the uh, plan development team. Is, is there any objection to that guidance moving forward? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next issue, which is the recommendation that soft quotas be maintained as a management alternative as applied to the small capacity fleet option. Um, questions on this issue? Uh, thoughts on the working group's recommendation that soft quotas be maintained? David Borden? Yeah, uh, maybe two questions. One question is, do all soft quotas count towards the overall TAC? The answer is yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'll pass on the second one. Thank you. Questions, thought on, thoughts on this issue, in particular the recommendation to keep s soft quotas in the document, and again, as applied to the small capacity fleet option. Is the board comfortable with that? Dr. Pierce? Yes, I'm very comfortable with that. I think it's a uh, good concept, and in light of the the guidance you just provided, Mr. Chairman, regarding the two fleet and three fleet option, it'll provide for more, uh, I wouldn't say a challenge, but it'll be more informative for all of us because the small capacity fleet is defined in different ways depending upon two or three fleets. Um, so that, that might influence our, our eventual decision about whether to go with a soft quota for the uh, small uh, capacity fleet. Uh, I, I make that point because I look at uh, the two fleet option and I see, you know, the drift gill nets and the weirs and the pound nets and the floating fish traps and I'm thinking, well, that, wouldn't that possibly result in a rather large amount of uh, Menhaden being landed? So how do you justify a soft uh, quota for that particular, those particular gear types? Well, if it's only 5% of the total landage of the commercial fishery, then I suppose it's not a big deal. So again, I support the, uh, the, the, the soft uh, cap. Thank you for that. Any further thoughts on this issue? If not, I sense we have concurrence on keeping it in and moving forward. And as such, we'll now take on issue three, which is the question of whether the board remains interested in including a set of, set of alternatives pertaining to seasonal allocation. If I'm not mistaken, the working group's recommendation was to uh, strike that, uh, from that set of options from the uh, uh, document, and so um, we're looking for questions and or comments on that recommendation. The issue is seasonal allocations. This would be a tier one option, so it would be in lieu of uh, that reduction bait breakout, in lieu of a fleet capacity. Um, it would be just breaking out the entire fishery into seasons and managing it uh, accordingly. And the working group's thoughts on that were uh, no, that if there was essentially that it does not uh, warrant 
remaining in the document. So thoughts on that? Rob O'Reilly? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think that Megan outlined the problem that could exist with a seasonal allocation when she gave her presentation. So um, it could be haves and have-nots depending on uh, the movement of the fish. So I think it should be removed. Thoughts on that recommend? Uh, well, so thank you for that, Rob. Uh, is the anyone else on the board wish to comment on this? Is the board comfortable with this recommendation to remove it? It would certainly help pare down the options, so it would be in keeping with the uh, intent of this discussion. David Borden? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Rob. I think it should be removed. I think it simplifies the document. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Seeing none, I think we have good guidance on this one, and we'll move on to the next issue, which is um, the recommendation that the current regional allocation options be removed from the amendment and replaced with an option that considers a regional quota for the New England states, Maine through New York, and jurisdictional quotas for the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic states. Um, questions on this? Uh, discussion on it? Uh, Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be opposed to a regional quota in New England. Um, where we are in Rhode Island, typically we would have the last shot at any fishery, and the perfect example is this year where there was no episodic event available to us. And unless the quota was high enough that we all had a nice piece of the pie, but I, I would be opposed to a regional quota in New England. Would you be opposed if that were the only region that had a quota as a way of preserving uh, access to the fishery for the New England region. Uh, I'm opposed to a regional quota in New England. Thank you. Other thoughts on this? D Dr. Pierce? Uh, I like it. I like Eric's uh, perspective. Uh, I definitely do not want to see regional allocation options replaced. Uh, what we're doing right now in our individual states in New England, I can speak specific to Massachusetts, and you know, we've, we've done quite a bit to figure out how to manage our individual quota. Uh, we may eventually have to go in a completely different direction depending upon what the final results are relative to this, uh, this addendum, but, but the regional allocation definitely would uh, put, put, um, put my state uh, in particular at a great disadvantage relative to who gets what first, depending upon the movement of the fish and the seasonality of that movement. So, no, I, I would not support replacing the, um, removing the, uh, I don't support that regional allocation option. So we really are just sort of two issues that are sort of getting conflated here. One is right now the addendum, I'm sorry, I keep saying it, amendment, draft amendment under option D, regional allocation has three sub-options. The first is a two-region split, Chesapeake Bay being one and the rest of the coast being the other. Option, Sub-option two is a three-region split. The first region is a New England region, the second is essentially a mid-Atlantic, and the third is a South Atlantic. And the third sub-option is a four-region split, New England one, mid-Atlantic, New, New York through Delaware being the second, Chesapeake Bay, Maryland through Virginia being the third, and South Atlantic being the fourth. So the questions, the, the question for the board is do you want to keep those regional allocation options, including all three sub-options in the document, or not? And if not, do you want to replace it with something else? So we're sort of, I'm sort of hearing two different things. I'm hearing opposition to the regional allocation approach. I'm hearing particular opposition to a New England regional um, approach. So I'm not sure if, I'm just trying to get a clear read from the board on, on how they want to proceed on this issue. Rob O'Reilly? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just mention what uh, the allocation work group talked about um, concerning regions, that it would break down to states within the region um, trying to make sure that they um, didn't go over a quota, and that could be somewhat of a complication. I know that was stated on the allocation working group. So let me pose the question this way. Is there any opposition on the part of the board to removing regional allocation in its entirety? I'll just stop there. Is there, is there any opposition to that? Is, is, does the board support removing regional allocation as, an, as a component of this uh, amendment? Uh, let me go to Steve Train first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I can see the merit to removing it, not knowing what we're going to get 
for a choice in the end makes me wish we could keep it in there a little bit longer. I mean, what we landed in Maine last year and the way things are changing, uh, having an allocation that's greater than having Terry and Pat begging and borrowing from the other states to get quota would be better for us. Now, can we do away with regional? Yes, but not knowing what we're going to get instead of it makes me want to be able to keep the option in it for now. Understood. Cherie? I agree. I think we need to maintain the regional option because these fish are moving. We are seeing uh, more and more episodic events further north and those need to be considered if the population continues to expand. Yes, Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to follow up on what uh, Cherise said, it's hard to separate this um, from the next issue of the time frames. Uh, and I, I kind of have a question to Megan. Um, you know, if we are seeing a shift of the biomass towards the north because of climate, um, do those time frames really adequately reflect what might be projected therefrom? So that if, you know, whatever we do on the regions, if we have time frames that are based on historic landings that really don't reflect where the fish are going, um, I, I think that would be, that'd be difficult. Thank you. Yeah, that's a tough question. I'm going to throw it back to the board. I mean, I think it's up to the board to make a policy, policy decision on the time frames and whether the board is interested in using historic time frames or pursuing the allocation work group's recommendation to go from 2007 forward. So, I mean, that's uh, the next discussion we're going to have. Dr. Pierce? Yeah, I'm uh, very much influenced by option uh, C in the, in the list of options. Uh, jurisdiction allocation with minimum base allocations. I suspect that uh, that option and one of those sub-options, one or two, would actually be of, uh, be of benefit to the state of Maine and to other states, notably to the state of Maine that's the last in line, so to speak, with, uh, with Menhaden, like the regional allocation that would include, uh, what is it, Connecticut through Maine that potentially would put Maine at a disadvantage. So uh, regional allocation in the interest of, uh, of uh, shortening the document, making it easy to understand, uh, and certainly supportable by, by me, regional allocation option D, I still think we could delete that and then go with options A, B, and C. You know, that, that, sh that should do the trick. But, but again, I'll, I'll defer to, uh, to the state of Maine if, if they if, uh, if, if Maine's representatives really feel that option D needs to be kept in there, then, then, then I'll, I'll support that. But, but I really do think it's, it's, it's unnecessary. And again, just to remind the board, we will be coming back to this for really a final review as a draft for public comment in August. So we will have another chance at this issue. Um, it's just to try to aid in the further development of the document, particularly with regard to the analysis of these options that we're really trying to um, address today. Uh, David Borden. Yeah, Ms. Chairman, question for you. Does this require more, if we leave it in until the next meeting when we, we review more details, does it require any more work on the part of the staff? Depends if we change the time frames or not. Is that, I mean, it may make some sense just to leave it in and then take this up at the next meeting and, just, and make a formal decision on it. People can think on it and so forth. And I think that's a really good fallback suggestion on, on, on these kinds of, uh, given the discussion we've just had. And, you know, just as a reminder, this is a tier two issue. And I think as the board becomes more fluent in the development of this and the nature of the uh, amendment, the no notion of first, you don't even get to this issue of regional allocation until you've gone through a tier one selection process. So I think what I'm urging everyone to do is sort of go back home, you know, really try to uh, digest this, this document as best you can, think through the, the sequencing, if you will, of the decision-making process that's going to unfold. Think about the public in terms of trying to make sure they can be guided through the process of assessing the options in a way that is clear and straightforward. And perhaps when we return in August, there'll be some, some clear thinking um, on, you know, what combinations uh, we want to keep in and which we might want to remove. So um, I, I get the sense that maybe for many of you, you're just 
be, you know, getting more and more familiar, but aren't at the point yet where you're ready to, you know, strike wholesale some of these uh, options. That's that's the that's the sense I'm getting. Uh, but if I'm wrong, uh, correct me. And if there's certainly any specific recommendations to, for example, take out any of the specific sub options on a regional allocation, now's the time to speak. Otherwise, maybe we'll just keep things together. Uh, David Blazer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, in the spirit of cooperation, trying to trim down a little bit of the uh, uh, document, um, I, I think we could eliminate sub-option one, which divides the regional allocation for a Chesapeake Bay and everybody else. Um, I think I, we're supportive of uh, eliminating that option. Is there any objection to removing that? So we would be left uh, with uh, two sub-options. One would be a, th a three-region split. The other would be a four-region split. We would remove, as, uh, as Commissioner Blazer just suggested, the, uh, the two-region split um, separating out Chesapeake Bay. Is there any objection to trimming the document just a bit in that way? Seeing no objection, we'll take, thank you for that suggestion, we'll, and we'll convey that to the PDT. Other thoughts on this issue, Rob O'Reilly? Uh, not on the region, but we had also uh, delved into the time frame, which is that's next. Okay, I, too early to comment. You might be only five seconds early, but um, let me just make sure we've we've wrapped on that. Have we wrapped on on the issue of regional allocation, or does anyone have anything else, Dr. Rhodes? Just one quick question. So we'd remove Chesapeake Bay, but would still have the catch cap in the earlier part of the document. So correct. It All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. I was thinking the same thing. So the Chesapeake Bay cap portion remains. This is just having to do with this sub-option. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion on this issue? Seeing none, and uh, Rob, I'll give you first crack at this. We're up to issue, uh, the, actually the last issue, if you will, on the list of issues to be considered, uh, at least at, from the working group's perspective, and that is the issue of allocation timeframes. Uh, the issue has two components. One is the question of whether reduction landings from states which no longer have a reduction fishery should be included in the calculations. The other is the question of whether I'm sorry, the question of which set of time frame options should be included in the amendment and used to flesh out the allocation percentages for every alternative that involves jurisdictional allocations. So I just want to make sure the board's clear. These time frames would be used in multiple ways throughout the document on each and every occasion where there needs to be a a allocation based on historical time frames. So you can see right now in the document, in the tables that have been developed that were presented and are in your meeting materials, how things would play out with regard to the, um, the current four alternatives that are in the document. In addition to status quo, there are four alternatives in the document. You also have a working group recommendation to replace those with, um, with four different alternatives. And um, I know Megan had put that slide up, but there it is, right there. So uh, right at the bottom of the slide is the focus of the discussion I'd now like to undertake, and that is uh, current time frames versus proposed new time frames. Questions, discussions on this? Uh, discussion on this, I'll go to Rob O'Reilly first. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm well aware that Robert Boyles and you have uh, hosted about maybe nine <laughs> seems like nine allocation work group conference calls and so we have discussed this and uh, I think in the document that has been prepared uh, the draft amendment three it's pretty clear that there are some problems with the historic information not only the lack of uh, data uh, back in time but also the fact that the last factory or reduction facility um, other than omega protein was around until about 2007. So we talked about that. We talked about the data deficiencies, and I think one of the recommendations, and there are uh, other folks on the working group, so if I get anything wrong, let me know, but one of the ideas was there was a comment that 2013 to 2016, the second option, was actually going to be almost a continuation of what had happened, even though it followed um, Amendment 2, and certainly that was borne out that, you know, the, the proportion of harvest after Amendment 2 is there. The 2012, the fourth item, was because it, with Amendment 2, 
the board was just short of having any final data and it seemed like that could be included um, and then of course the 2007 goes back to the fact that that's where there is only one reduction facility um, and that's omega protein so um, I would recommend uh, and other working group members can chime in that the proposed time frames are really more suitable I know that it would be a struggle to try and recreate the past data and that's one reason um, the second reason owes to the reduction plants thank you thank you and just to help ensure that the discussion that ensues now is well informed at the end of the working group memo which is just a short two-page memo uh, in your meeting materials is a third page essentially and that uh, is uh, includes or is table one and it shows the state by state allocation percentages for the time periods recommended by the allocation working group that would be the set of allocation time frames on the right in, in the, on the slide that's up there now um, in your draft amendment I think it's table seven does that sound right sure. table seven in the draft amendment is the percentages that correspond to the current time frames on the left side. So you can do your compare and contrast or however you want to look at it by comparing those two tables that are in your uh, meeting materials. And I just want to make sure that this discussion is focused on those tables to, because that's, that, th they bear the fruit, if you will, of, of uh, how things would play out regarding the board's decision on how to uh, move forward. David? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question, um, just to kind of get a sense of how uh, the regulatory process has impacted the, the fisheries. Now, understanding that these things change from state to state, year to year, a lot of changes, but I guess what I'm wondering is, and the reason why I'm asking, over the past few years with a couple of huge cuts, or some significant cuts, is there any sense that that's caused any shift in any of the other fisheries, certain smaller fisheries maybe no longer found it practical to fish during those years and if so we've sort of set it up to almost shape the plan and determine who's going to get the fish afterwards is that a question or a comment I'm, I'm not sure if it's a comment well it's a question I guess I'm looking for a sense of whether or not the recent regulatory impact or changes have had any impact in where these fish are landed or if it's completely and totally just up to where the fish are I think the best way to answer that is to call your attention to Table 1 at the end of the working group uh, document. That shows the percentages that would be applicable for each of the time frames, one being uh, the status quo time frame, the other being uh, that period of time since the adoption of Amendment 2, uh, which for the first time put Menhaden under quota management and then you have some other combinations there. So I think really the best way to answer your question, David, is to just point to that table and you can see whether there are any impacts that you can discern or not uh, that I think that's the best way to answer that question uh, so I'll leave it there Megan did you have anything else on? okay I'm trying to do my best to answer questions and I keep forgetting I've got my expert right here to my right uh, Cherie so some states uh, actually had uh, decent fisheries or decent landings back in the late 80s early 90s New Hampshire being one of them so I would, uh, of course, be more uh, leaning towards the current time frame so that we actually do uh, or can show that we did have viable landings that can be attributed because if we go with the proposed time frames, we have 0%. Understood. Additional thoughts on this? David Borden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'm actually opposed to the proposed time frames of the working group. And I, I just remind everybody that the state of Rhode Island, uh, under the existing allocation, got 66,000 pounds. Uh, if you went back o over the time frame of 1985 through 2015, there are periods there where, when I worked for the state of Rhode Island that we landed 25 million pounds. So there is an enormous difference. Uh, part of the reason we're doing this whole addendum is because the, when the allocations were made, they, they simply excluded those long-term time frames. I'd also remind everybody that when we went to public hearing, at least at two of the hearings, there was almost unanimous agreement on the part of the public 
to include a longer time frame. So I'm opposed to taking out the long time frame. I think it should be included for public process. Thank you, and let me remind the board that there's really a two-part, this is a two-part question. One is whether we keep the time frames or not, and David and Cherie have just spoken in favor of supporting the, uh, uh, the current time frames that do stretch back. The other is, should reduction landings from states that no longer have reduction fisheries be included in those uh, time frames, those calculations, or not? And uh, again, a two-part question there, and I think we are looking for board uh, guidance on, on both issues. Dr. Pierce. Yeah, I, I will uh, reflect on your suggestion earlier on, Mr. Chairman, that it is a tiered approach, and we need to focus on that as we get ready for the next meeting. So, you know, with that said, uh, I do uh, favor the current time frames. Uh, if for no other reason, then again, it does include a longer time period, and I'll specifically reference Table 2 in the document, where, consistent with what you said, these time frames will be carried through the entire document, all the different options, and that Table 2 references large capacity versus small capacity fleets. And depending upon the years you pick, the small capacity fleet does get maybe twice uh, what what it otherwise would get. So, um, I'm um, I'm influenced by Table Two, and as a consequence of that, I, I prefer to leave in the, the longer the longer time span that includes uh, the 1984 and and later. If you don't mind, I'm going to now challenge everyone on the part two of that, and that is, do you support which approach do you favor a, t a, s a time series that includes reduction landings from states that no longer have reduction fisheries or a time frame that uh, that essentially cuts them out there is good historical information as I understand it on the per seine fisheries so this would be from for states like North Carolina um, and others that once had reduction fisheries but no longer do should those landings be included in the long time series that you're supporting or not? Uh, I would not include them. Thank you. Th I appreciate that. And I'd like to, again, s ask every board member as you comment to speak to that second part of the issue as well. Thoughts on the issue? There seems to be um, more support for keeping the current time frames than replacing them. And I'm still waiting for uh, more input on the question of whether historical reduction landings from states that no longer have reduction fisheries should be retained or not. Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question and, and then I guess a comment, um, or two comments. So in terms of what time frame should be used for allocation, we have current and proposed. Is, is that for all references in this document to time frame? So that would include, again, going back to a tier one choice, um, the allocation between the bait fishery and the reduction fishery. So, all right, okay. Um, in, in terms then of what time frames to use, uh, I'm not opposed to keeping the current time frames, except that I'd like to include 2013 through 2016. And I don't know what the easiest way to do that is if we just change 2009 to 2012, but then that's not really, um, that doesn't reflect, I'm going to say status quo. Or, or, or what the current allocation is, is based on. And, and then, in, in terms of your question about do we include states that used to have a reduction fishery, I would say yes if we're going to go back to the 1950s and look at historic landings back to the 1950s when New York had a reduction fishery. We're not going that far back, at least as proposed. We're only going back as far as 1985. I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I'm sorry, I didn't pick up on that, sorry. Um, Robert Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking for solemnic wisdom here on how to split the baby. Um, and many of you who I have spoken to over the years about allocation know that I favor kind of a weighted approach because we all want what we want. Um, you know, I make a note that South Carolina has a history of a reduction fishery and yet we made a policy decision many, many years ago to, um, 
effectively abandon that fishery. So, uh, you know, it's why I like a weighted allocation. There are some of us who like more contemporary time frames, um, and yet some of us like a longer time series. And so what I look at in terms of a weighted allocation and why I favor it is that you, you weight it both equally and you split the baby that way. So uh, I'm not quite sure where we're going to go. Um, I'm interested in, in final disposition of this, of course, I, I hope in November, and hope we can come to, uh, to some consensus on how to best address it. But, but it's why I, I think I like the weighted allocation. You look at a long time series and you give that half, and you look at a more contemporary time series and you give that half, and you split the baby that way. Thanks. Thanks, and Robert, I'm not going to leave, let you off the hook. Do you, in supporting that weighted allocation, which would in part rely upon the 85 through 95 period during which there were reduction fisheries in some states that no longer exist, would you support keeping those landings in or removing them? I'd remove them. Thank you. Dr. Duvall? Well, I'm going to agree and disagree with uh, my neighbor to the south here. So I also like keeping the weighted allocation in there because I think it helps to um, bracket what the capacity was in different areas of the coast at, at different times. And I think just because some states, you know, like North Carolina, no longer has a reduction fishery and, you know, due to legislative action, it's highly unlikely that we'll, we will probably ever have a reduction fishery again. That doesn't mean that there's not the capacity there to harvest more. So that's one of the reasons why I like the weighted allocation. And I would probably favor keeping those reduction landings in there, but, you know, that's me. Thank you. Uh, Terry Stockwell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, th I think we're all going to cherry pick what our favorite allocation is, I meaning depending upon where we live and when we had our fisheries. Um, certainly there's, you know, from the northern perspective, there's some wisdom for me to be in favor of a longer t time series. I could also say a weighted allocation if we looked at this last year. I'm personally hoping we don't use uh, time frames at all as we move forward for the final decision. But I mean, tongue in cheek, Mr. Chairman, um, if we're going to go back and looking at, at old uh, um, rendering plants, uh, my hometown had three of them back in the 1800s. So, wisdom of the board on this one. I, I'm trying to discern and think about all the comments that have been offered, and is there a common thread here? Uh, I'd really like to get maybe another comment or two from folks who have been thinking about this and, and uh, have, a, have a recommendation for a way forward. Again, thinking about the fact that we have status quo and four alternatives under current time frames, we have, and which we can keep, and it seems like there's more in, uh, board members in support of keeping that. I frankly don't know if I've heard too many, if anyone suggests replacing. And then I definitely sense a mixed feeling on the issue of whether uh, historic reduction landings from states that no longer have reduction fisheries should be kept in or not. So maybe a little bit more discussion on that second point in particular, uh, with, a, with my sense anyway from my perch here that the consensus that seems to be emerging is to stay with the current time frames on the left of that slide. Uh, but again, looking for more uh, clarity on that second part of the question. Roy Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, speaking from the perspective of a state that once had a uh, reduction fishery, and like Emerson, I would have to go back to the 50s and 60s, I, I don't feel that uh, it's appropriate uh, for us to consider the landings from that reduction, those old reduction fisheries. Um, the infrastructure that supported those fisheries no longer exists the dock space, uh, the fleets, everything. All of that's ancient history. So I, I think it would be prudent to just eliminate these reduction fisheries that occurred before 85. Thank you. Thank now, you. For and, and subsequent to 85. I understood. Thank you, Roy. I appreciate that. Uh, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we made this decision to pursue ecosystem reference points, recognizing it was going to be very difficult for us to move forward. Maybe I should step back here. Um, and we are diligently working in that direction. 
and at the same time trying to grasp this uh, grapple with this question of allocation and I think it just strikes me I'll follow up on Roy's comment that um, and, and Terry's somewhat tongue-in-cheek comment but it's a true statement I mean we we have had capacity in these communities for for generations um, and you've heard me say before um, you know the communities are important but I, I look at the same time that we are you know trying to move this ecosystem this fishery forward and so I think it's important that we recognize the capacity that we have now uh, with respect to um, reduction um, and recognize that we've got terrific demands um, on bait uh, and so I would say you know for the purpose of, of keeping the orders of the day mr. chairman um, that we um, keep the current time frames but not include um, those historical capacities in the reduction fishery Thank you for that. And here's my suggested way forward because I do think we need to move on. Um, the work is, if we keep the current time frames, as I think there's pretty good consensus to do, the, by and large, the work's already been done on the, on the two, two ways of looking at those. And you can go into your document and, and after you get home and, and, and see more of what I'm referring to if you don't know what I mean. And each option has sort of with reduction included, not without reduction included. And my sense from what I'm hearing and I think the direction we, that I'm inclined to offer the PDT uh, based on this board discussion is that the board's preference is to use the current time frames w without including the reduction landings from states that no longer have reduction fisheries, but we'll keep that data set um, sort of in our back pocket or off to the side, whatever you might, however you might want to referred to it to be potentially brought back uh, at our August meeting if anyone felt so strongly that it needed to be. But at least for the purposes of, of further refining the document, we would focus on just that one approach. Is there any objection to doing that from the standpoint of furthering the development of this document? No final decisions are being made right now, but it would, it's more about giving the PDT the guidance they need in order to, and, and Megan, of course, in her lead role here to you know, really further work on this. Is the board comfortable with that approach? Is there any objection to that approach? Steve Train? Thank you, Ms. Chair. The only thing that makes me uncomfortable is uh, uh, the fish were harvested, the state land, someone in the state landed the fish, and then because uh, they chose to sell it to a reduction fishery, uh, reduction plant that's no longer there, we're not going to count it anymore. And that doesn't make sense to me. It would have sold, been sold somewhere else if the reduction plant wasn't there. So it was, it was landings that belong to the history of that state, and I have trouble pulling it out. Do you have an objection to the approach I recommended, which is sort of a, a it, well, let's put it this way, Steve. If we can keep the document just as it is right now, and each option has two alternatives, one with reduction landings in, one with the reduction landings out. Is, I hear you saying that's, that's your preference, to keep it that way. Is, is that what I hear? Yes, and, I, and the reason I spoke up is you said you were going to work forward in one direction but keep the records of the other, and I, I had a problem with that. Yeah, so I'm going to try and broker this by just suggesting, because I really think it's important to kind of keep everything together as much as possible, even though I saw some heads nodding as I was trying to offer a way forward that was a more refined way. Um, in fairness to uh, Commissioner Train I, 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 and others who have spoke on this issue, let's keep everything in, but let's vow to really roll up our sleeves and look at this document between now and August um, in the sense of coming back in, uh, at our meeting in August with some very clear, uh, with, with a clear sense as to how you think this should go out for public comment. Um, I think we've come a long way today in, in this discussion and our understanding of the issues and the options. Um, August is only three months away. It's not that far. I would just suggest that might be the best way forward. Is there, I, I, I sort of feel like on the one hand I should offer some leadership here and perhaps make some calls, but on the other hand I don't want to make a call that uh, might disadvantage or, or be perceived as disadvantaging certain states and certain interests. So um, 
Does that sound like a better way forward to keep it together with both options, both approaches in? Do I, I don't see too many heads nodding. I see one, one affirmative. This is a tough issue. I'm really looking for consensus here. I don't want to put this to a vote. In August, we might put it to a vote. In fact, we will. In August, we're going to be voting on these issues. So maybe that's the way to really think about it. We need to really come to a resolution on these issues at our August meeting. We're kicking the can down the road a little bit here today, which is okay because we're in midstream. We don't need to make a final call on what goes out for public comment. But in August, we will. So fair enough. I think we've had a good, robust discussion on these issues. I'm not planning to further it anymore unless anybody wants to. Um, and Megan, do you have any? No, no reactions. I didn't get any elbows or anything on that one. So I guess I'm, I'm okay with that suggestion. And I think it is the best way to kind of keep this process together. Just know that August is going to be a good meeting. It's going to be a good meeting in August. We're going to really try and get this thing, uh, come to terms with it. All right, with that, um, and w the clock is ticking. We do have uh, D Dr. Pierce. Yeah, before you go on to the next uh, agenda item, I would suggest that we could actually remove uh, 4.3.1.2, the indecision clause. Uh, I know it's, it's it's a stick. Last time around, we had a problem setting the uh, the quota for the year, but that I think was kind of a unique situation. The nature of the motions that were made, we boxed ourselves, boxed ourselves in. But then at the next meeting, through your leadership skills. We ended up coming to uh, agreement, and we set ourselves a TAC. So I, I don't think, I think that's needed. Thoughts on that indecision clause and whether it needs to be kept in or not? And by the way, I wasn't planning to move on to the next agenda item. I was planning to open the floor to additional comments, as Dr. Pierce took full advantage of, on other items that we uh, haven't yet discussed. So on this issue of the indecision clause and uh, the carrot stick approach, if you will, to uh, more of a more of a stick, I think, to um, uh, to get the uh, board to make a decision. Is that needed? Uh, should that be kept in the document? David Borden? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, question then, uh, if we take it out, then what happens if we don't make a decision? That's a great question. That's why we put it in. <laughs> so we would, we would, we need to specify what happens if the board does not provide, uh, or is not able to come to a consensus, because we were pretty close to that. David? Yeah, I, I was going to suggest that, uh, the, with all due, due respect to the PDT, I thought that, uh, as Megan characterized it, carrot and stick, and I was going to suggest uh, that we use the Danvers half long, that's a carrot, a very short carrot uh, a, approach, and maybe we should pick up a, a range of percentages there. Leave it in, but have a a different range. Instead of having it be 50 percent, maybe have it be 75 percent or 90 percent, and then the board has some, and it wouldn't trouble me at all to say that the quota stays the same or it gets reduced and have some different percentages there. Does that sound like a fair approach? Uh, David? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I certainly agree, and as a military guy, I'm all for accountability measures. I am uncomfortable with putting those accountability measures on the stakeholders, though. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments on this issue? We've had a suggestion to keep it in, but uh, perhaps not make it quite so onerous with that uh, half uh, cut, maybe something a little bit more, uh, you know, less onerous. So if I see a few heads nodding, so why don't we take that as the guidance we'll offer back to the PDT to uh, keep this in, but um, not make that stick quite so uh, heavy and uh, and dangerous. Okay. Uh, other comments or other recommendations on any other issues that Megan addressed uh, having to do with the uh, draft amendment? Uh, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Megan, in your presentation a couple of times you referenced um, 212,500 metric tons as a trigger, I think, for different things to occur. And what does that 212,500 metric tons derive from? Those are the average coastwide landings from 2009 to 2011. And I believe it was the first TAC established, wasn't it? So that was what the um, Amendment 2 was based on, and then we took a 20 percent reduction from that. Yeah. Uh, I saw Dr. Duvall next. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I was actually going to go back and um, Megan had brought up uh, an allocation. So if our eventual allocation method is implemented that does not have a jurisdictional component, the requirement to report landings via SAFIS. And I have, I understand that the intent is to try to provide real time monitoring, but I have concerns about this based on North Carolina statutory requirements that, you know, that our dealers report to us. And right now we use um, federal, so in order to track our quota monitored species, which we do on a daily basis for summer flounder and black sea bass, we have a dealer permit. It requires submission of a quota monitoring report, not trip ticket reports to us daily, which we can't, we, we can't require daily submission of trip tickets um, by statute. You know, we're looking to try to, to modify that. I think my point is that if, if, if the amendment specifies the frequency um, and required data elements in terms of real-time reporting that the states ought to be allowed to submit those data in to meet those requirements, I guess is what I'm saying, and not necessarily dictate that you have to be reporting directly to SAFIS, because we're going to run into some problems with that in North Carolina. Thank you. So, Michelle, maybe in response, um, where would you be submitting those reports to? Because what I'm trying to avoid is have the FMP coordinator be kind of a um, receiver of states' landings on a weekly basis. I think that that's kind of a owner's position to put the coordinator in. So I'm, I'm just trying to put it all in some place where people could check it um, and all the states could be submitting to one place. You know, perhaps that's something that we're going to have to discuss offline. But again, I raised the statutory issues that we have in North Carolina that data be submitted to us first. So if we can perhaps work to try to develop an alternative that would, you know, both meet our statutory requirements as well as not having um, dealers submitting information directly to the FMP coordinator, you know, we might, we might have to find some workaround for the division submitting data to SAFIS on behalf of those dealers that that might be an alternative. Thank you for that. Rob O'Reilly? Pretty much the same situation in Virginia and so we all will have to have a conversation about how to accomplish this if it doesn't go jurisdictional. Um, so we've had mandatory reporting on the harvester basis since 1993 and so as with Michelle, the data comes to VMRC, so we would definitely have to work something out if, if it ends up that we uh, don't go jurisdictional. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, thoughts from the board? Eric? On any issue, the floor is open right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the 212,500 tons um, that Emerson referenced earlier, um, is that are those percentages of allocation at that amount fixed in I, I'm, I'm looking at uh, 4.3.2 tier one option e sub options one and two um, uh, if the 212,500 tons is su subject to a reallocation that's one thing but if the current our current allotments are fixed in at that number I would like to see that entire section removed so we had this discussion at the last meeting there were some recommendations to remove that and um, it the, the consensus was to keep it in uh, I know Rob has been a, a strong proponent of that option and uh, I'll let Rob speak to it Rob yes thank you so um, it used to be option H now it's option E um, this was proposed um, in Maine and the idea is that again we came relatively close to having a 10 percent increase and then everyone knows the story of how we uh, came back with the increase that we had um, so we were relatively close still to 212,500 metric tons no, the only idea there is that there would not be fixed percentages associated once that 212,500 um, is reached or is attained, they would be variable. And I think in the document, um, it has two different percentages where the bait would receive a larger share. So, you know, up to 70%, I think is what the document has. 
So that was the basis for, for that back in Maine. It remains the same. I think that, um, you know, last time around, uh, Nicola asked it to be removed based on the public comment, and um, I had a few things to say about that, which I won't say today again, but, you know, really the public comment at that time was really not looking at our process, um, you know, to the direct way. So that's why that option is in there, Eric, and uh, don't know whether that helps you or not. Eric, a follow? Yeah, it absolutely helps me, Rob. It tells me that uh, I don't like it and you do, so it's going to stay in the document for now. That's what it tells me. Um, so, okay, I have, can I keep going? Please. Okay. Are you good with that, Rob? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at, at in, in the draft document on pages uh, 53 and 54. Uh, it is uh, minimum quota plus additional quota. Um, I don't know how much work it is to, uh, right now the numbers that I see are 0.5 percent and 1 percent. Um, just for reference, I really, I would be fine if 0.5 percent were dropped out of the document, um, but I would like to see some analysis at um, at least 2 percent, and if it's not too much of a pain in the uh, neck, uh, 1.5 as well. That, that would be my request, and uh, I mean, if it's, if it's, if we have the capability at some point to say, okay, we have the analysis at 1% and we have the analysis at 2%, can we do something in the middle or can we just extrapolate the numbers? The numbers don't extrapolate very well in my mind, but at least they're close enough for me to make a decision. So I guess that's my request. Can we do a table at 2% without too much trouble? The answer is yes. We, it can be done if, if, if there's no opposition uh, on the part of the board to add another uh, sub-option uh, having to do with minimum uh, jurisdictional quotas, uh, and that would be in addition to the ha half percent, although I know you recommended taking it out, but one thought is to keep that in, keep the one percent, and then add a new two percent option. Does that sound fair? Is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just, like, like I said, I, I can't extrapolate 0.5 to 1. It doesn't, you can't just multiply them times 2. I would like to see what 2% looks like uh, plus, the, plus the addition, 2 plus X, for lack, lack of a better term. And if I could have that, I would be, uh, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, duly noted. Other uh, suggestions, we are running late. We've got a couple more agenda items here, but uh, this is obviously a very important uh, issue. So, uh, David Borden. This, this on the, just for my own edification, the, on the quota rollover, uh, and the, uh, specifically the option to roll over 100% of the quota and, and 50%, I, I, you know, I'm struggling with that a little bit because I can't think of another example of where the system uh, the management system in any area has allowed the rollover of up to 100 percent of the quota. Uh, I mean, I, I've listened to a lot of uh, different discussions at council meetings and, and commission meetings about rollovers, and generally the scientists uh, voice a lot of concerns uh, because you're a whole year later, you've had natural mortality on the stock and a whole bunch of other variables. Uh, they can't be calculated. So what, what is the scientific uh, advice on 100% rollovers? Uh, the TC has not reviewed this document, so I can't really provide scientific advice from them. But we got those five options from board input based on the PID. So if the board would like to reconsider the options that are in there, that would be useful information. Yeah, I, my preference here would be to have the technical people specifically review that issue of the rollover and whether or not it, it uh, creates problems uh, from a technical perspective. Duly noted. Thank you. Any other suggestions, comments, recommendations from the board on this issue? Seeing none, I hope to uh, get some public uh, input here, but we're really running late. We've got a couple of other, three other actually important issues. Uh, I don't think they'll take too much time, but we're, I'm well aware of the clock and the need to break um, it, uh, in either four minutes or at some point soon thereafter. Um, so 
Item seven on the agenda, we're gonna move on. Is there any objection to moving on? Seeing none, we'll move on to item seven on the agenda, which is New York participation in episodic event program. Um, this issue was addressed in part by the board last year, but may need to be readdressed uh, this year to lend clarification to the issue. I'll let Megan summarize it and uh, set the stage for the board's consideration. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so just to briefly review the episodic events program and what it will look like in 2017, um, in May of 2016, the board passed a motion to extend the episodic events program until Amendment 3 is implemented. So we do have the episodic events program for this year. Um, the set aside is roughly 4.4 million pounds, and that reflects the 200,000 metric ton tack that has been specified for this year. In May of 2016, the board also approved New York as an eligible state to harvest under the episodic events program. So as a result, for 2017, the states of Maine through New York can harvest from the set aside, pending they meet the mandatory provisions. The board also capped New York at 1 million pounds for 2016. Um, there is currently no cap on New York's harvest for 2017. Thank you. So that's where things stand. If the board were to take no further action, New York is eligible to participate in the program in 20, that might be a signal, uh, in 2017 and is not subject to a cap. If the board wanted to change that scenario in any way, action would be needed today. Does anyone have any recommendations or thoughts? Terry? Yeah, yeah thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deja vu from a year ago. Um, uh, keep this quick. I am going to move that New York harvest is capped at 1 million pounds for 2017. Under the episodic event program? Under the episodic event program. Is there a second to that? Seconded by Cherie, moved by uh, Terry Stockwell, seconded by Cherie to uh, reimpose the 1 million pound cap on New York's participation in the episodic event program for 2017. Discussion on the motion. Uh, Steve Hines. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, probably that's a wise move on the part of the, part of the board because as of today, our directed fishery is closed and you can walk across the water on the backs of the Menhaden. They're so thick in New York. We need this uh, episodic events just to try to at least forestall fish kills. We're going to have them. It's just um, maybe we can put them off for a few weeks. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Eric Reed? Uh, I just have a question. How much... Uh tonnage or poundage did New York harvest last year? Megan's looking into that. Uh, while she's looking into it, any other questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, we'll wait for the answer to that and then we'll uh, take a vote. Steve? Now, if you don't need an exact number, I think we were around 400,000 of the episodic. Um, I don't have your episodic number, actually, because I believe it's, it's confidential, but total state landings were roughly 1.4 million, so that's bycatch, episodic, directed. So do you want to just let your comments stand, Steve? That uh... Well, I know that we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't hit the 1 million mark, but that was because we had, we had reached a point where we believed we had, we had gotten out of the woods. And then in November, we had 5 million pounds of dead fish. So I, you know, you, you, I can't really judge this anymore. Eric? Um, I'd like you to give a million pounds to Rhode Island of episodic event, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, no, I'm fine. I, I just, if Rhode Island's going to be out of the fishery because episodic event get used, gets used up again, uh, that would be unfortunate for the state of Rhode Island. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Other uh, uh, comments? Robert Boyles? Mr. Chairman, uh, parliamentary inquiry, I'd like unanimous consent to strike Mr. Hines' comments from the record on the basis of information from staff. Given the potential confidentiality? Y yes. Is there any objection to striking those comments in the record to protect any potential violation of confidentiality? Seeing no objections, they, those comments will be struck. Thank you for that suggestion. Other comments uh, on the motion? Seeing none, is the board ready for the question? If so, all in favor of the motion, please. Uh, I'm sorry, do you need uh, a 15-second caucus?
Okay, I'm going to call the question. All in favor, please raise your hand. Eighteen in favor. Opposed? Uh, null votes. Abstentions. Uh, eight, the motion passes 18 to 0. And we're on to item 8, which is to provide guidance to the technical committee regarding stock projections. Um, this is a prelude to setting the TAC for 2018, which will be on our agenda for our next meeting in August. I believe our TC Chair Jason McNamee has a presentation, so at this point I will turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we at the Technical Committee were sitting around chatting and we said, you know what the bo board hasn't heard from us in about three months? Projection methodology, let's do that again. So I, I've got a quick presentation. This will help support the addendum. Um, if, uh, Kristen, if you wanna jump to right to slide four, we can skip some of that early stuff. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a whirlwind tour of the projection methodology uh, it has not changed. Um, the past several times that you've seen it. So um, Monte Carlo bootstrap runs of 2015, the uh, approved assessment, the base run of that approved assessment was used for the basis of the projections. Uh, they were run under various scenarios for a total of five years uh, since that terminal year. Starting conditions uh, include initial numbers at age, which were the estimated numbers at age for year 2014 from BAM for each of the Monte Carlo bootstrap runs. So Monte Carlo bootstrap runs, it's just an iteration of the model. It, uh, certain elements of the model have a little perturbation to their starting values. Um, and you end up with about a thousand different versions of the world. They're all very close, but slightly different. And that's where you kind of determine your variability in your estimates. So the numbers at age after that initial year, a uh, fancy equation to look at here. Um, the important element there is that Z parameter up in the air there. What that is is age and year specific total mortality. What that consists of is it's uh, the addition of the natural mortality for each age for that year, plus the fishing mortality that takes into account the selectivity uh, by age. So the natural mortality for each of the projections uh, was a vector from each of the Monte Carlo bootstraps. Um, the selectivity, again, also a vector from each of the Monte Carlo bootstraps. In this case, the northern and southern fishery selectivities, there are the values from the last time period. So there's a couple of blocks in uh, the BAM model and we're just grabbing uh, the last um, block, so the estimate from the last period of time. Uh, and then fishing mortality is estimated to match the annual landings that are uh, estimated. Um, so these landings, where do those come from? So those are uh, calculated using the Baranoff catch equation um, and the weight of the landings. Uh, there's recruitment in there. This is an important one to think about. Recruitment is projected uh, without an underlying stock recruitment function. So there's no Beverden Holt or, or Ricker model in here. What we're doing is taking uh, median recruitment level, and that's the median from each of the 1,000 um, bootstrap runs. And then the way we get variability in there is there's a uh, deviation vector in there. And so there's this um, vector, it's the length of it is the number of years that you're looking at. We have a median uh, recruitment level and then each year is a deviation away from that median. So that's where your uh, uncertainty comes from. Um, and those are selected randomly with replacement from each of the runs. All right, so we do all that stuff and we get some outputs and these are relevant outputs uh, for you folks. They include fecundity, so remember that that's what we use as the biomass uh, metric for Menhaden. Produces fishing mortality, recruitment, and landings. Those are the model outputs uh, that you get from the projections. Um, fecundity is calculated as uh, the number of fish in each age times the reproductive vector at that age. And so we know 
um, a little bit about the or a lot about the fecundity of Menhaden, and so that's all um, taken into account here. We use a 50-50 sex ratio, the maturity um, as we understand it for Menhaden, mash that up all together, and that's how we uh, come up with the uh, fecundity um, estimate. So, a couple of uh, caveats for you. Um, we did not include structural uncertainty in the projections. This is um, model uncertainty is another way that people characterize it. There's lots of uncertainties that are accounted for, but this is not one of them. Um, they, the projections are conditional on a set of functional forms. These are things like the selectivity function, which is a curve in recruitment, as I've described. Um, the fisheries were assumed to continue at the current proportions of allocation, meaning uh, bait and reduction, uh, using the current selectivities. Uh, the selectivity aspect of that is, is the important part. Um, and so new management regulations that alter the proportions or the selectivities would likely affect uh, the projection results, so just be aware of that. If future recruitment is characterized by uh, long periods of um, large or small year classes, that's also uh, going to impact the um, the projections. And you know, when we end up at year five, um, and the answer is different than what we projected, there's there's a number of reasons uh, why that is. Additionally, because we're using the Baranov uh, catch equation, it, it's assuming mortality occurs. Um, throughout the year, and so it, again, if seasonal closures and things like that go in, that's going to affect um, the outcomes uh, of reality versus uh, the projections. All right, just a couple of slides here to, um, we can think back. This is what you had asked us for last time. Uh, we did uh, projections for you, and so Current TAC uh, is not the current TAC now, it is the current TAC back when we did these, uh, but that was like a status quo projection you asked for. Then we did a series uh, that were fairly simple, they were just increases um, from that TAC and then that was projected um, forward. And then you did a series where you were thinking more about risk and you um, asked for three different levels of uh, you know, these risk probabilities of being uh, at or below the F target. So in summary, uh, we are performing, uh, and by we, I mean uh, Amy uh, Schuler, who's in the back there. Um, we're performing new projections based on previous guidance from the board and as outlined in, in the presentation. Uh, we added in some new scenarios that include interim ecological reference points as requested, and uh, as Jana already noted, we uh, conferred with the folks at LENFEST to make sure that we were interpreting uh, their intent, so um, we're all on the same page there, and we don't bring something forward that then um, someone uh, might come back and say, no, that's not what we meant by that, so we've, we've done that homework. Um, and we are on track. I, I have completion in August, that's right, right? Yeah. So we were uh, on track with the work. So that's it. Any questions? Questions for Jason? Uh, Adam. Thank you. So did I understand correctly that you're going to apply those same projections, the 5% increase, the 10% increase, the 50% probability, the 55% probability? Was, was that what I heard or did I mishear that? Yeah, um, so I'll actually, so th that's not what I showed. I just wanted to show you the types of things that we have done for projections in the past as, as an example. Um, I'm not actually entirely sure the exact ones that we're doing. Um, and so Megan, I don't know if you have a, or Bob, if you have a better idea. The issue I think for the board is, is the board comfortable asking that those same projections be run again so yes, it would be repeating the same, I, whatever it was, seven runs. I think there's more actually when you add in some of the additional um, ERP type approaches. But is that is that what the board would like to see again in the same way you saw it last year and use that as the basis for your uh, deliberations on setting the TAC for 2018? Or would you recommend doing something different, either reducing those options or changing them? That That's the issue before the board today. So I guess the question is, 
is, if the board, if we don't have any recommendations to change anything, we'll run the same projections in the same way uh, that they were run last year, and uh, uh, you'll get a report on those uh, at your August meeting. This is the time to recommend any changes. If you don't have any recommended changes, you'll see those same projections done in the same way. Must be getting late because I don't see any any movement, anybody shifting except I see one hand up in the back. Rob? Yeah, I support moving ahead with those same uh, runs. And uh, the second thing is I will ask one question, and I, I know it's late, but what really determines the risk against the target F? And is there any uncertainty there in the risk? So bog you down. Kind of Kind of curious. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. So um, there, is, what determines that is the, so I had mentioned we do these Monte Carlo bootstraps, so you end up with this, these, you know, variations of, of the universe as you move forward, and, and they're different from each other, and so what you do in the end is you kind of bound all of the different projections, um, and that's what determines that envelope of uncertainty around you know some median value or or something like that so if you picked it to be right at the median it'd be you know 50 percent probability and then you move up and down from there so it's all of the uncertainties you know coming out of the bootstrap on the elements in the projections that we put those um, those perturbations on Any other questions, comments? Is there any opposition to uh, tasking the TC with running the same projections that they ran last year in the ways just described? Seeing none, I'll take that as, uh, as board support for uh, a repeat, and we'll look forward to the results that we'll see uh, in August. Is there anything else on this issue? Okay, so we're on to our final issue. Consider approval of the 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports. Uh, states were required to submit their compliance plans by April 1. The PRT reviewed those plans and reported out via the FMP review, which is in your meeting materials. Uh, so Megan, I think, has a brief uh, summary report. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to go right to slide four um, to just kind of get to the meat of the FMP review. Um, so for 2016, our TAC was 414.2 million pounds, and overall, I would say landings were down from 2015. So our directed harvest, which excludes bycatch, was 396.15 million pounds, so that's 4.4% under the TAC and a 3.6% decrease from 2015. Bycatch was 2.18 million pounds, which is a 63% decrease from 2015, um, but it's important to note that those landings do not count towards the TAC. Total harvest, including bycatch, directed harvest, and the episodic events program was 398 million pounds, which is a 4.5% decrease from 2015. We can also look at the landings by the different sectors. So looking at bait harvest, it was roughly 95.4 million pounds, which is a 5.6% decrease from 2015 and a 10.1% decrease from the previous five-year average. The states of New Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, Maine, and Massachusetts landed the largest shares. Reduction harvest was 302.9 million pounds, which is a 4.2% decrease from 2015 and a 6% decrease from the previous five-year average. In terms of the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap, landings were less than 45,000 metric tons, which is well below the cap. So this means for 2017, our cap will be the full 87,000 metric tons plus the almost 11,000 metric ton rollover. Um, this is our figure, one of the figures in the FMP review, which shows reduction landings in blue and bait landings in red. Um, it is important to note there are two different uh, Y axes here, so reduction landings are still higher than bait landings. Um, but overall, we've seen a slight decline in reduction landings over the years, while we've seen a slight increase in bait landings. This is table one in the FMP review, and I recommend looking at it in the printed document because it's much easier to see, but it shows average bycatch landings by state and gear type from 2013 to 2016. The predominant gears include pound nets and anchored or staked gill nets. 
and the states of Maryland and Virginia contribute the most to total bycatch landings. We can also look at the number of bycatch trips that were taken in 2016. Um, there were a total of 1,908 trips taken, bycatch trips taken in 2016. Um, this is significantly lower from the 4,668 trips taken in 2015. The majority of these trips did land less than 1,000 pounds. In terms of the episodic event set-aside program, the states of Maine, Rhode Island, and New York participated in the program. 3.8 million pounds were harvested in 2016, which is uh, a much greater value than has ever been harvested under the program. 92% um, of the set-aside was used, but the remaining unused set-aside was reallocated to the states on November 1st. Table three, this is quota performance, and I definitely recommend looking at this in the FMP review. Um, but what it shows here is on a state-by-state -state basis, the transfers that took place, what the total quota was in terms of what a state was allocated, plus or minus transfers, and then the redistribution of unused set aside. And then it shows what total landings were and if there were any overages. So we had one state with an overage, that was Florida. Um, it's only 4,000 pounds, though. Um, and then the final column there is 2017 quotas. So this is based on the 200,000 metric ton TAC, um, as well as any overages that uh, took place in 2016. Non-de minimis states are required to conduct biological monitoring based on their landings as well as their geographic region. Um, so this table, this is table six in the FMP review, shows the number of 10 fish samples that were required and then the ones that were carried out by each state. Um, all states did meet the biological sampling requirements. In terms of de minimis, the states of New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida have requested de minimis status for 2017. All states qualify because they do not have a reduction fishery and their bait landings in the two most recent years of data did not exceed 1% of coastwide bait landings. And so the PRT recommends that the board accept the 2017 FMP review de minimis status for the five states there. And then also notes that jurisdictions which repeatedly or grossly exceed their quota should consider implementing more frequent reporting to avoid these overages. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Questions for Megan on her report? Uh, Dr. Duval? Not a question, just um, a comment. So, Megan, I, I believe you received information last week correcting North Carolina's 2016 landing. So, they're roughly about half of the 800,000 pounds that was shown up on the screen. So, we just we had a coding error with um, landings from a particular dealer. So, um, that's since been corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I would entertain a motion to accept the 2017 Fishery Management Plan review and approve de minimis requests for the states of New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Uh, moved by Steve Hines. Do we have a second? Seconded by uh, Cherie uh, Patterson. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Is there a need to caucus? Seeing no indication, uh, is the board ready for the vote? If so, all in favor, raise your hand. Eighteen in favor, and that's unanimous. So I think we are at the last item, which is other business. Is there any other business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any opposition to adjourning? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Um, the annual awards of excellence reception is essentially through that wall and starting at 6.30.